possible a have, terror group. Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you are with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We are live with you from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up on today's programme, Prince Harry has lost his legal challenge against the Mail on Sunday, who he's suing over an article that claims he attacked that he claims attacked his honesty and integrity. Uh, meanwhile, Rishi Sunak is on the ropes. The Prime Minister is under pressure after his new Rwanda plan caused a deepening rift among Conservatives. And outrage as a Bristol University professor calls for anti-Semitic violence, tweeting that somebody should blow up the venue where a Jewish conference was being held. All of that's coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Thank you. Prince Harry's libel case against the Mail on Sunday must go to trial, according to a judge at London's High Court. The Duke of Sussex is trying to sue Associated Newspapers after it said he was trying to keep his legal war with the government over his security a secret. The media group is contesting the claim. A judge has now decided the case must be heard in court. Royal correspondent Kinsey Schofield told Talk TV the original security plan put in place for the Duke of Sussex was more than fair. They are saying that it's a case-by-case -case basis. They're not saying, Harry, you're on your own, figure it out. They're saying, if you want to come over, we're going to look at your circumstances and we'll determine whether or not you get the security that you want. Uh, they're not saying that he is constantly in jeopardy and he's always going to be alone. They're just saying, could you give us a heads up and we'll determine based on what your plans are, how or if we're going to protect you. And I think that that's fair. A judge has ruled in favour of the UK government blocking Scotland's gender self-identification bill. Legislation to make it easier for people to change their legally recognised sex was passed by Scottish ministers last December, but became a constitutional dispute when the government stopped the bill from receiving royal assent and becoming law. Pressure is piling on Rishi Sunak over his Rwanda policy after it was revealed the UK has already paid out £240 million to the African nation for the scheme. Another bill of £50 million is expected next year. MPs will vote next week on the Prime Minister's plan to send some migrants to Rwanda to deter channel crossings. Lord Marland, Tory peer and friend of Boris Johnson, told Talk TV a split Conservative Party is not what Sunak needs. The country, by and large, doesn't forgive uh, a party that uh, is uh, split. They want them to spend their time running the country rather than arguing amongst themselves. That doesn't mean to say there shouldn't be debate, and of course... This Rwanda issue is uh, a, a, a subject of significant debate, and so it should be. Thousands of people are expected to line the streets of Dublin later to pay their respects to Shane McGowan. The Pogues frontman died last week, aged 65. His coffin will be carried through the city by a horse-drawn carriage accompanied by a lone piper. The funeral will be held later on in County Tipperary. Millions of mobile phone customers could receive a payout following a legal challenge against four networks. It's claimed Vodafone, EE3 and O2 overcharge customers for phones beyond the end of their contract. Consumer champion Justin Gutman is seeking damages of more than £3 billion on behalf of 4.8 million people. And there's more evidence that the cost of living crisis is making the festive season tougher. New research suggests one in four of us is likely to give a second-hand gift this Christmas to cut costs. Most people say they're likely to describe it as pre-loved, though. Katie Beeching from the Caring Family Foundation, which runs winter wonderlands in schools, says people are really struggling. They are experiencing homelessness and they're ex extremely... Ex 
they are experiencing poverty. We have one in four children in the UK are living in poverty and over 5,000 families on a monthly basis are becoming homeless. So this is having a huge impact on children's mental health, their physical health and their educational attainment. That's the latest now. It's time for a weather update from Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. So this is the showery low that's triggering a lot of showers across western and central areas today. But there will be some sunshine and drier weather across the south and southeast. They're much better than yesterday. And temperatures are actually doing quite well in southern areas, uh, 11 or 12 degrees, nearer 8 across northern parts. Now, through this evening and night, that uh, showery low over Northern Ireland starts off really quite intense, but it does gradually weaken as it pushes northwards. Then there's a little bit of reprieve before we see the next weather system coming in that will bring rain right across the southwest by the end of the night, perhaps even as far east as the London area. So a wet end of the night here, gusty as well, but a frost-free night across the board. Tomorrow's weather's interesting because that rain gradually pushes northwards and grinds to a halt in central areas. So if you're travelling and you live across central Britain, be prepared for some quite high rainfall totals, not particularly pleasant there. Gusty to the south, but the rain does clear through at least. Temperatures in the south, very mild, up to 12 or 13. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including the latest legal blow to Prince Harry, as well as Rishi Sunak's desperate defence of his Rwanda plan and, of course, his leadership. And today uh, we are joined in the studio by Rebecca Ryan, commentator and campaign director of Defund the BBC. Uh, welcome, Rebecca. Uh, well, you arrive on a timely week. Uh, the uh, licence fee has just gone up by about 10 quid from 159 to 169. £9.50. Uh, the original proposal was £173.30. Where did they get these numbers? 50p, the ran random 30. number generator. Where does all this come from? Uh, but your thoughts? Well, I think it's just they're literally just trying to keep business as usual uh, going, aren't they? You know, and they're plugging the gaps where we've got people of older generation realise they don't want to pay for this woke nonsense anymore, so they realise they can cancel their license, <laughs> TV licence. And you've got young people just refusing to even ever have a TV licence because they just don't consume it in that way. So the BBC is just coming up with these numbers literally to just keep things going. But, you know, they, they have to wake up to the fact that there's a huge amount of the British public who aren't happy. Mm -hmm. Poll after poll shows around about two-thirds of British people want to get rid of the TV licence. Mm -hmm. You know, it's outdated. It's discriminatory in the way it's collected. You know, 74% of women are the ones who are, who are uh, prosecuted for non-payment. So it, there's something really wrong it's there. Wrong. And, you know, so, they, yeah, they just want shot of it, really. But, you I think... and I, but Alex, so let me get your view on this because you and I have, I wouldn't say cross swords about it, but we seem to be, I'm a bit more hardline about the license than you are. <laughs> the I one just, thing you're I more hardline about. But, you, but you've talked, I think, very validly about yeah. the news service. I mean, right. it does provide a decent news mm. service. I don't like its news, I think it's biased. But, it, but my point is that the whole thing about the BBC, I, I'm not against mm -hmm. the BBC. I want the BBC to exist. I want all media outlets to ex exist. I'm a journalist, but I, I don't want to pay for the BBC. If you want, the BBC, yeah. a pay for it by subscription, or the BBC must get its own commercials. Well, my argument was going to be, it's interesting, because I was going to pick up on exactly that, that once upon a time, people might have been able to argue the BBC is a public service broadcaster, and therefore it should have the best quality news in the country, mm. completely objective and unbiased. Um, I mean, I would argue it should have the sporting matches mm. of uh, national mm. importance, where largely they're pay-per-view these days. But even when it comes to the news service, which is something I'd once upon a time have defended to the hilt, especially the World Service, they've hardly showered themselves in glory <laughs> when you look at the way they've been reporting yeah. on what's going on in Gaza. Absolutely. And it's atrocious, isn't it? And the, yeah, it really just goes yeah. to show the, 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 the sheer power that they have to change world events mm. by how they yeah. misreported yeah. what happened in, in Gaza. But it's I don't, that I don't think I wanted it should... to defend, mm. and now I'm like, it's not the power no, either. Exactly. It's the power I want to see executed. Yeah. I don't think it should be a public service no. broadcaster. I don't think we should have anything like public service broadcasting. Television, radio uh, should be for you if you want to watch it or listen to it. 
pay for it or they take adverts. It shouldn't be our financial burden. The uh, TV license fee is absolutely anachronistic, absurd, makes us look ridiculous around the world. You can go around the world yep. and say, do you know in Britain, if you don't uh, pay to watch Strictly Come Dancing, they send you to prison. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a standing absurdity. Yeah. It's true, oh, though. I haven't watched Strictly Come Dancing ever. Well, <laughs> When's my custodial sentence? That's just sentence? one example. I know there are other programmes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, I do really object to having to pay for Strictly Come uh, Dancing because yeah, I no, hate that it. load of nonsense. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, by the way, uh, you're both... I think, I'm a trained observer. You're both women, aren't you? <laughs> are, are we even allowed to say that these days? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, now, Joey Barton, uh, the former mm. Man City star, and uh, last uh, was a manager of League One Bristol uh, Rovers, I think it was. Uh, he has given an interview to Piers Morgan in which he says uh, that uh, women should not be allowed to commentate or comment on men's football on the TV because women's football and men's football is a very, are very different games and basically women don't know what they're talking about when it comes to the men's games. Your thoughts? Yeah, so I think, I don't know what you think about this, but I think, look, I'm not particularly... I'll leave it to you two. Not, yeah, I'm not woke when it comes to these matters. I'm not. Um, but there are plenty, and I don't think women should be um, shoehorned into stuff and that happens yeah. way too often and yeah. that's just annoying when you think they're not here on merit they're yeah. here because it's a woman and it's some sort of tick box exercise. But there are women sports journalists like Claire Balding, who talks on a whole range of sports that she yeah. doesn't play. Gabby Logan, yeah. who's brilliant and much loved around the country. I'm a huge fan of Formula One. Plenty mm. of women now in that sphere talking about that. So actually kind of creating some sort of ban mm. seems a bit ridiculous, yeah. but certainly don't shoehorn them in. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. I don't think they should be shoehorned in. It's not good for yeah. women and it's not good for anybody to have that sense of, oh, they're just getting that job for to tick a box. You know, yeah. that's, you know, a turn off for absolutely everyone but at the same time if they viewers should be able to vote with their feet shouldn't they at the end of the day they should be able to say you know if i don't i don't like listening to this i'm going to switch this off but when it comes to big matches that's mm. pretty difficult to do you don't want to miss you know the football match and what have you so i mean I'm... i'll tell you what i think just briefly before we get to our viewers question is this some women i mean i watch a lot of football i will watch a lot of the punditry and i treat the women pundits and the women commentators just like the guys some of them are good yeah. and some of them are crap mm. uh same as the blokes so uh i don't believe women should be banned but uh, i think uh, women who are bad at doing it yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't be, be on the yeah. screen. Simple yeah. as that. Look so at that, we all that's agree. Quite I, think, yes. I think that's quite oh, modern of me, actually. Uh, but to, so, to be serious for a second, we are asking you today. Uh, Joey Barton says women should not commentate on men's football games or indeed comment on them. Is he right? Uh, straight question. Give us a call on 0344 499 <laughs> 1000. Text us on 87222. Don't forget to write talk in your message. Or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. Uh, to our top story, though, now, thank you very much for your assistance. <laughs> you love it every day. Uh, as always, uh, Prince Harry has lost a bid to have the mail on Sunday's defence uh, to his defamation case thrown out by a judge. The Duke uh, is suing the newspaper group for libel following an article about his security arrangements in the UK, which he claims was an attack on his honesty and integrity. The Mail uh, on Sunday argue it was an honest opinion <laughs> and did not cause serious harm to his reputation. Take it up, Alex. Yeah, I keep... no, I, no, Kevin's just like I blasting keep... through all of it. It's not I'm my fault. They didn't put your Friday. name up. Carry on, Friday. please Kevin, do. Kevin's doing this show. I'm not here. So, no, I was quite happy. I was relaxing. Mm. I didn't even know where we got to But now. today. Right, thank you. <laughs> but today, a judge refused to do so and concluded that the male had a real prospect of successfully showing that the prince's statements provided a misleading description of his case against the Home Office. If you managed to keep up with all that, well done. If you didn't, don't worry, because we're joined now by Talk TV's loyal correspondent, Rupert Bell, to explain the lot of it. Right, Rupert, um, so give us in a nutshell, what has gone on today? Well, basically, the, the gist of it is of an article that was published back in February of last year. Then there is this court case and, and Prince Harry taking this court case and the defence from the associated newspapers is saying, that uh, there was misleading statements and the article they put and the judge has deemed it an honest opinion but but the nut the nub of it is is that he said a statement said that he was always prepared to foot the bill for his security well that the mail on sunday article and uh, when it was published was suggesting that it, that only came subsequently and therein lies the sort of legal semantics surrounding this case and clearly Harry had hoped to have it thrown out, but the judge obviously concede that there is some case for the defence, i.e. the Associated Newspapers. But 
Clearly, Harry's security issues have been exercising him greatly because obviously this week we've seen him in court on a separate trial as he tries to get the Home Office to uh, uh, pay for his security arrangements. So it's all sort of linked uh, as to the way he feels he's not being treated right. But what will happen now, it will go to a, a hearing next week and then it will expect now to go to trial sometime next, next year unless there is some legal uh, agreement in the meantime, if it doesn't go to trial. But the judge is saying, yes, it now can go to trial. Yeah. I hope. Uh, and he's, uh, also, Rupert, in then... In a nutshell. What's he done, what he's actually done, the judge, uh, Rupert, is he has decided uh, that uh, the newspaper's honesty uh, is uh, definitely to be uh, stuck up for, whereas uh, he's not so keen on Harry's honesty. Uh, on, uh, uh, Harry, well, Harry said that this article impugned his honesty and integrity. Uh, the newspaper, the Mail on Sunday, said, we wrote this story. The, and the essence of the story was this. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Sneaky yeah. Harry has tried to keep his case, his uh, legal bid to have royal armed protection, police protection when he comes to this country. He's tried to keep it secret. Uh, now, uh, the Mail on Sunday is saying that that story was based on honest opinion. The judge has accepted that uh, and it has thrown out uh, Harry's contention that that impugns his honesty and his integrity. So the judge has quite clearly sided with the newspaper here. This is a very bad day for uh, Mr Wales, isn't it? It's not looking good for his legal <laughs> team and Harry. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest, because he does say that the defendants have a very good case to answer for. So... Uh, that, that, again, puts the Harry's legal team on the back foot. Now, how is it going to play out? As I say, this private hearing next week, it might be that they feel now it's not worth taking it any further. But I'll tell you what, Harry isn't half paying a lot of money to lawyers at the moment um, because he's got a lot of cases sort of around and about at the moment. But obviously, he's had this week's one, which, of course, he wasn't in court for, but obviously he's hoping that he wins this one and gets... Um, the Home Office to uh, give him the level of security that he wants. But clearly, they were always going to give him security um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is the issue. Um, Harry feels he should be deemed a special case. And now he's having his, his own honesty questioned by what the judge has said today. I mean, this is the problem with how litigious he is. I mean, the boy should go get a job rather than just get more lawyers. <laughs> but uh, this is the problem, really, because when you look at the nuance of the court case about the police protection mm. or not, and now he's turning around and saying, well, look, or, you know, I can't bring security who can carry their own arms. Only police in the UK can do that, and I would happily pay for that myself. You know, you can understand a little bit, I suppose, that, you know, why he might want that in place and why perhaps we could potentially provide it. Oh. But then he goes... No, I mean, I'm saying nuance. Some people might, right, you know. But... Name me one. Well, me, I actually don't think if it was, you know... You think the taxpayers should pay for no, his protection? No, what I think... What, no, get, out, no, get out of the no, studio. No, that wasn't out what of the I said. Studio, that was, I did not pay for his protection. What I said was if he was going to pay for one armed security guard who's able to carry a weapon in this country, fine. Um, but yeah, there but, are... But other... this is about hiring the police force. Yeah, no, I know that. Not Kevin, let me finish my sentence. Yeah. Right. Anyway, what I was going to ask... Please haven't Rupert... got one arm. They're not allowed to have one arm. Got two. <laughs> <laughs> carry on, sorry. I really might just go home and start my weekend early. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of up for going to the pub, to be honest. What I was wanting to... <laughs> sorry. No, no, carry no. on with the show. What sorry, I sorry. Wanted, what I wanted to say is the problem is, constantly, every time he might make some steps forward with getting public sympathy, he does something yeah, like this and yeah. blows it up again. Good point. Thanks. Uh, well, <laughs> this, is, this is his problem. Um, and... Actually, the, the, there's no one saying that he doesn't deserve some level of protection when he's in this country. But let's work out what the security threat is on a case by case basis. And this is the problem for him. He does believe he is a special case. And he's saying that the reason he had to leave this country because he wasn't getting the security that he wanted. Yet isn't he just as vulnerable wherever he should live? Because so he has to have sec he has security around him but of which presumably he's paying for in the States. So um, coming here, he would be afforded some. So he can be seen to be a person that could find himself as a, as a security issue. But I have to say he does not help himself 
by what has created around him over the recent months. It's not, you know, he has not put himself in a good light. Right. And this is, the whole thing is adding to the sort of sadness of the situation so that is developing yeah. around him and, and the rest of his family. But so what we're trying to get our heads around, Rupert, is uh, today it, all, it also emerged, actually last night, that uh, as part of his other uh, lawsuit, uh, the one at the High Court, about whether or not he deserves Royal uh, Armed Police protection, uh, he said he's actually put into the court that, that, that him and uh, Meghan were forced to leave the country. And I don't get that. Uh, secondly, uh, because I don't think they were. They were not forced by anyone. Secondly, he said that the royal family uh, stopped them being frontline royals. I don't think that's true. Uh, and uh, thirdly, if they had remained, if they didn't assume that they'd been forced out of the country, they could have remained here as frontline royals and received all the uh, armed police protection that the rest of the royal family get. Instead, he said, that for the sake of my family's safety, I'm off to the gun murder capital of the world, America. None of it makes sense. It's incoherent. Well, this is the problem um, for him. Um, he wanted to back away and he says he uh, was back, going to be forced out of the royal family. And I, to some extent, totally agree with you here, Kevin, um, that actually he did not need to take this. Uh, he saw there was a whole cone of everyone was against him. The problem was, to some extent, Meghan wanted to be a higher profile member of the royal family, but protocol meant that he was, she was always going to be married, I think it's now the sixth in line to the throne, that his status was always going to be diminished. And so we could never, and I'm not sure, she was comfortable with being the sort of number two to Kate. And we're starting to see that with what's come out in the book, that she always felt over that she could not, uh, Kate overshadowed her, and she wasn't comfortable with this. So the situation actually came about for different reasons, rather than the security issues. He wanted, with Meghan, to have a, a, a... didn't want to then continue to be doing the royal duties, of which, you have to say, Harry was incredibly good at and always showed that it was always great fun and people enjoyed him coming. They enjoyed when Meghan arrived as well in this country. Suddenly, history has been rewritten so many times around the Sussexes, which I think is frustrating, one and all. Talk TV's royal correspondent, Rupert Bell. Thank you very much. Always good to have your company. Uh, Rebecca, what do you think about this? Uh, uh, you know, I, I would never have a go at anybody who's worried about the safety of their family. Uh, everybody worries about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, moving to America, because you're worried about the safety of your family in Britain, where gun crime is relatively uh, low in number, uh, and moving to America, the highest number of gun murders in the world by a country mile, doesn't make any sense, does it? I don't think anything about this couple makes any sense, really, does it? You know, they, they, they seem to be flailing around, like, desperately trying to grasp onto some of the sort of the, the, the glitter that comes with the royal family and trying to hold on to that, but at the same time, dragging the royal family through the dirt. And, you know, in another world, Prince Harry would be some drunk guy sitting on the end of the bar moaning <laughs> to everybody in sundry, wouldn't he? But because he's got all of this power, he can he can get headlines in you know in all the in, in the world's press, not just the national press. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really sad, and I think we just all come back to every time the story comes out, the Queen's the late Queen's statement of recollections may vary, and that just yeah. sums them up, doesn't it? And it's just so frustrating for it's... for Charles, for William, and for Kate. I mean, Kate is being right. bullied mm -hmm. on the global oh, scale. She, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you and, agree and with, with me, Alex, maintaining so, a dignified well, silence. Do you do you agree? Uh, I think, as I say, I, 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 of course he's worried about his family. Every Everyone worries about their family. But I think, in the end, this hasn't got to do no. with the safety of the oh, family. Of course it's not. It's got to do with his yeah. status. Yeah, yeah, Why yeah. can't exactly. I have I think the same as the rest of my family? This is two people's collected narcissism, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. him yeah. being second in line, you know, after his brother and yeah. always being slightly jealous yeah. of that. And it's her yes. wanting to be yes. the next Princess Diana and yeah. realising Kate's got there first. <laughs> yeah. And the two of them went, oh, no, it's not fair. Some unpleasant headlines have been written. People don't adore Meghan wholeheartedly every mm. second of the day. Therefore, we're going to go to yeah. somewhere like America where we're going to be 
be big, shiny celebrities and celebrating. We're going to do all these big projects and be the biggest superstars on earth. <laughs> and now it's kind of going a bit wrong and they're going, oh it's gosh, sure we better go is. back to grizzly old Britain again. <laughs> you know, but we've really upset them yeah. over there. Um, it, it is a bit like sort of, you know, two very peculiar individuals finding each other, both with the same sort of... Yeah. Uh, and what's their other... What did you say about him? <laughs> you said you gave him a brilliant term. Uh, like I'll, th Harry. I'll think about it later. I, I'm not, it, may anyway. not be, it may not have been broadcast. It's like industrially deranged or uh, something. But, uh, yeah, they, they're also obsessed, you know, talking about status. Yeah. All of the royal family, particularly these two, Harry and Meghan, they're obsessed with their titles. Mm. You know, again, yeah. they've got nothing else in their life yeah. except to worry about status. So, what do you mean I'm only the Duke of Sussex? Why can't <laughs> I be the, the King of Sussex? All this nonsense. Why haven't our kids got titles? I mean, they're just revolving around sort of nonsense really they're all absolutely. to do with status absolutely and that's the hypocrisy that really winds british people up particularly because you know they they've trapped the uh the, the royal family and you know on the oprah in interview everything that was said and people have you know still reeling from that years later but the fact is that then they're still using the duke and duchess yeah. titles mm. to make money and it's that's just it's really true. wrong isn't it it's, it's, it's awful sad. sad and bitter isn't mm. it mm. Right, now, coming up after the break, panic is rising in Downing Street amid fears the Prime Minister might be forced to call a snap election if ministers continue their revolt against his Rwanda bill. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And still in the studio with us is political campaigns consultant Rebecca Ryan, who's here for a roundup of all the top stories of the day, including growing revolt among Tory rebels. What's new? Furious at Rishi Sunak's not so new Rwanda plan. Um, I mean, Rebecca, it's like you can't open a newspaper or read a you know website without someone suggesting that a letter of no confidence is going in. And you just think, what is wrong with these people? What is wrong with this party? Yeah. That there is absolutely nothing that they can join forces around and yeah. back each other on. And it becomes about the faction fighting and not about delivering on governing the country. Exactly. It's just so short-sighted, isn't it? And it's like a return to the sort of Brexit years where Theresa May had like a tiny majority, hardly an effective majority at all. But this, this is a government that has an 80-seat majority, or almost 80 seats. We've, they've lost a few. But, you know, and they're behaving like this. And the thing is, they know full well that this plays really, really badly on the doorsteps. They know that the last time, you know, that they, they got really punished in the polls was because of the, the uh, expenses scandal and they all turned on each other. So they mm. know. Mm. And they're like lemmings marching towards, you know, the they impending doom. Themselves. And, you know, so it's, it's really... It's really bad, but also it just highlights those those factions and those schisms in the party where you've got these sort of centrists who are like really used to getting their way mm -hmm. or like run to the, the, the newspapers at the first to give a quote and push things out. And then you've got the right wing of the party mm. who basically speak to the, the Conservative Party voters. You know, they, they're, they're the ones fighting for what people voted for. Um, Do you know what I, I think he's in big trouble now? It's his own cowardice. Absolutely. Uh, the, all of this uh, circuitous nonsense we were in, mm. inflicted with yesterday, these, uh, oh, well, parts of the Human Rights Act will be able to circumnavigate and the uh, clauses in the ECHR Migrants Charter, we can get round this and all that. All of this is because he hasn't got the guts to do the obvious yeah. Thing. Leave the European Convention on Human Rights. If he did that, what the hell has he got to lose now? Mm. You never know. People, but he could leave the ECHR and we could stick a flight in the in the air or tomorrow. They, yeah. He could then get some mm. votes. Although you've got to give some advance warning before you leave it, and then that would have to be voted through Parliament and people wouldn't vote through it, and although this rebellion would yeah, just but continue. It's a good, but Thank announce you. it. Announce it. Oh, We're going it, to leave. I agree with that. We're just saying this is leave. what we are going to do. I've yeah. made an executive uh, by decision. By the way, talking of uh, we were talking about the the uh, Tories' uh, extraordinary propensity to argue about absolutely everything. <laughs> As I said earlier, uh, if somebody, if a Tory MP tweeted, it's a lovely day today, 50 would tweet, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, they are currently arguing about uh, this BBC uh, presenter, a news presenter, who just before going on air gave the camera the finger as a joke, but yeah. didn't realise she'd left it too late, went onto the air. Quite funny. She's had to apologise, all that. That somebody, the Tory official website has put a pic, has put a picture of her up. I think we were, there it is, there it is. We're, we're, <laughs> we're blurring out the offending part. You know, it's a finger, folks. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, that somebody from the Tory central office, official Tory, uh, tweet. There it is saying, uh, this is the response you get from <laughs> Labour when you ask them what they'll do about the, la uh, the migrant crisis, which is, to my mind, is quite funny. Mm. Uh, immediately, you've sort of got all these MPs go, take that down, this is beneath <laughs> us! Others say, no, 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 it's very funny, leave it up there. The new hill I to mean, die on. come on, yeah. grow up, it's just a tweet. Well, what is wrong with oh, them? Absolutely. I mean, this is the thing with CCHQ, is that they are, you know, they they're often paralysed by sort of this fear of getting something wrong. So they play it very, very safe. But occasionally they'll come out with a tweet like this that actually Twitter loves that kind of thing. You know, they'll mm. go crazy for mm. it. You know, the Conservative Party's doing something a bit feisty. Oh, look at that. It's going to get them a load of engagement, whether it's good or bad politically and, and as a sort of social media strategy, it's a sort of sensible yeah. thing to do. But then, of course, then you get the backlash from all of this sort of extremely <laughs> pious... This belittles us. Oh. This is beneath us. Oh, for God's sake. Do you really think that we all hold you in such high esteem <laughs> that we are, we'll be... Uh, your, uh, our view of you pretty, will be diminished? Pretty sure that that's not the thing that's going to be losing you votes. Yeah. Just suggesting. Yeah, just saying, just saying. Uh, right. Speaking on the topic of migration, yeah. though, broadly speaking. It's interesting, isn't it, mm. to see what is going on around Europe. And we're very bad, actually, at casting an eye on what happens on the continent of Europe. We just sort of um, ignore
ignore them and then think whenever we That's do something we it's extreme. It's pretty much why we left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wanted to. We're not really them. in Europe, now are we? We're our, our own little continent <laughs> yeah. separated by sea. Um, but what is interesting to see is how many countries are now toughening up their borders. And yeah. Germany's seen its illegal migration drop because they've suddenly gone right. We're going to do border checks now, along with eleven other countries in yeah. Schengen. Yeah. No. It's and. That's the thing, like you say, that it's OK when you're on mainland Europe because they're kind of almost protected by this sort of collective responsibility that's like, oh, well, you know, if the EU's doing it, if Europe's doing it, you know, they've probably got sensible reasons for doing it. But over here in the little uh, UK, um, our media just, you know, it, the, the, the left wing media, they just absolutely tear things apart when any kind of suggestion is made along these lines. As, as soon as we do something semi right wing and then yeah. people get upset about it, you go, yeah, but Germany and France <laughs> are doing it. And then all the sort of Europhiles go. Oh, oh, another, oh. another question here is, uh, <laughs> would be interesting to hear what you think, uh, Rebecca. Uh, Alex and I were talking earlier saying, well, wait a second, this was about a, sort of three months ago, Germany finally said, yeah. oh, you know what, we've got a real migrant crisis yeah. here. Uh, let's toughen up our borders. Let's ask more questions of people coming in. And what has happened? Their migrant crisis has virtually disappeared. Yeah. Uh, the numbers coming across their borders has plummeted. Why can't we do this? Exactly. Well, this is the thing that's so frustrating. And the, the fact that we've got that sort of the, the, the middle class in this country looks at Germany, looks at France and thinks, sees them as a sort of so progressive and so liberal. But actually, they're not, you know, they're no more, you know, progressive and liberal than the UK at all. When they, when they feel they need to make a stand, they will make a stand. Also, Netherlands. I mean, what's going on yeah. there? You know, <laughs> Kurt Wilders, the most of your right-wing politician to walk Europe's well, land for a long time. It's very interesting. It is super interesting. Uh, so There'll be someone coming out of the jungle soon, is all I'm saying, Kev. <laughs> so do you like train journeys, Rebecca? <laughs> Here, Starmer has revised his opinion. He used to like them, he doesn't like them anymore. Uh, I think uh, hopefully we can show you some uh, footage of uh, his uh, train journey from hell when he was assailed by a pro-Palestine fanatic. Uh, let's take a look at that. Yeah. How many more children in Palestine have to die before you call for a ceasefire? Over 7,000 children have died. Over 7,000 children have been slaughtered by Israel. This is unacceptable. What happened to human rights? What happened to democracy? We call for peace, we call for democracy. We don't see any of that when it comes to the Palestinians. 7,000 children, how many more have to die? 20,000 people, how many more people have to die? This is unacceptable. Where is your human humanity? Sir, Where is your humanity? Please don't touch me. Please don't do not touch me. I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong. OK, I'm not doing anything Does he realise that Keir Starmer can call for a ceasefire a thousand times over and there wouldn't be a ceasefire? I mean, like, what is the point in haranguing him on a train? But this is typical now of a certain type of person, right? And you can see by the backdrop of that clip that he's not exactly poor, is he? He's not sort of sitting on the luggage rack eating a baguette bag of what's it, yeah. you know? So, and this has become this sort of luxury ideology. Yeah. It's, it's the new Gucci handbag, isn't yeah. it? What, what travelling on trains or being pro-Palestinian or... Being pro-Palestinian. <laughs> <laughs> the whole lockdown menu of, you know, pro-trans, pro-Palestine, oh, you name it. It's, it's, it's the new designer Indeed. accessory. Indeed, it's middle-class dinner party conversation, isn't That's it? And right. the thing is That's that it's exactly a really it. complex situation over in Israel and Palestine. Mm -hmm. You know, this two-party state thing, this has been going on you know, for decades. And it's not something that can be uh, brought down into a soundbite for social media at all. And so that, that people will look at that and they'll probably feel a bit sorry for Keir Starmer, actually, that he's being harangued in that way. Because you can't, you can't get a soundbite. There is no simple answer. And right. just sort of coming out with numbers about sort of how many children of it, you know, that's just really manipulative, isn't it? And it's, yeah. not, it's not representative and it's not part of a sensible conversation because there's many, many um, Israeli children uh, and Jewish uh, children who've also been... Also uh, pretty uh, much in the Hamas magic calculator mm, Exactly, well. yeah. yeah. And we'll talk about that more after the break uh, because uh, it is a situation that requires our attention, I think. It does indeed. Well, coming up after the break, the FA has finally apologised for refusing to illuminate the Wembley Arch with the colours of the Israeli flag after the October Hamas attack. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. 
criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the author Douglas Murray has been in Israel and Gaza for Talk TV over the past few weeks. And yesterday, he sat down with the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog. The president dismissed accusations of genocide against the Palestinian people and said that Gaza would need a regime change if it ever was to have a two-state solution. Internationally, people calling, claiming that what uh, this country is doing in Gaza is genocide. What do you say it's to that? It's a terrible remark. The genocide was applied on us. On the, it was a clear genocidal attack of thousands and thousands of people on thousands and thousands of, of innocent civilians. Israel is taking all necessary steps by international humanitarian law to uh, improve to uh, apply its right of self-defense in the proper manner. Meaning, if you attack me from your home, right nearby, with missiles, with grenades, with guns, with whatever, I have the full right to go and catch you and kill you. It makes sense to have the two nations dwell in peace in some sort of a, a peace agreement. But right now, it's totally detached from the reality because the reality requires us to deal with the pain with the fear, with the trauma. Our nation has gone through huge trauma. Why would any Israeli accept under such circumstances the notion that five, ten minutes from here there could be a, a, a hostile army all of a sudden doing the same? And therefore, in order to move to peace, one has to deal with the root feelings of the nations and, fa and satisfy us and also the Palestinians in the way how does one secure their safety. Many Israelis have lost 
their sense of confidence and they want to make sure that now we have full confidence. That will require a, a new regime in Gaza. We will have to work on it. The world has to take a deep breath and work with us on this. Uh, to reflect on that, uh, to reflect on that, uh, and uh, the rest of uh, the day's top stories, we're still in the studio with political campaigns consultant Rebecca Ryan. Uh, she's uh, with us now. Uh, your thoughts on uh, that conversation? Uh, Douglas Murray's been out there for us. For uh, some of his reports have been. Uh, uh, extraordinarily good yeah. uh, uh, and uh, this interview seems very interesting your yeah. thoughts yeah I think that it's like I said earlier it's, it's a really complex situation but also at the same time Israel has just been um, suffered a, a huge attack on innocent women and children but young men as well and all men too so you know it's it's too soon to sort of be saying but what about this what about that you know he's absolutely right that they can't be, Hamas were in, in control in, in Gaza. So they can't be, you know, they can't do a deal with Hamas. You can't do a deal with the people who have literally come across your borders and murdered uh, innocent people in, in such a horrendous way as we've seen. So yeah, he's, he's absolutely right. I mean, the difficulty here, of course, and like you said, the nuance uh, is something that people don't tend to understand, is it isn't just Hamas who mm. don't want Israel to yep. exist. It's a lot of the entire mm -hmm. neighbourhood. Yep. And whenever people are pushing for a two-state solution, they seem to want this done at the expense of Israel. Yep. And I think that is... A, I mean, I don't understand why Israel are losing the PR game so badly when it comes to international opinion, why most people can't see that this is a plucky little country that, frankly, is in the most hostile neighbourhood mm. on earth for, for Jewish people. Absolutely. But I think it's, it's very much a, a fashionable left-wing position to support Palestine, and it has been some time, as we, as we saw with Jeremy Corbyn, you know, and his issues with anti-Semitism, is that, you know, it was, it's very fashionable amongst the world or the, or the Western world, sort of middle-class classes to be pro-Palestine as it is to be sort of pro-Tibet and what have you and that, that, that's a different argument but it's a fashionable position to take and people are, are very concerned these days with you know winning woke points on social media and being this is where it is and so therefore when we have a, a left-wing uh, media to an extent globally in the western world therefore they get you know it's easy to push that side and it was it's the, the speed with which that side was pushed yeah. you know immediately after the horrendous attack on israel that be, is so uncomfortable the, the, for people this, the, the labor party the left wing of the labor party in particular but left wings and their obsession yeah. with one place mm. is bizarre so when uh, jeremy corbyn uh, during those dark days was the leader of the mm. her majesty's opposition uh, actually within shouting distance of becoming our Prime Minister. Can you imagine that? But basically, had you have asked, uh, Mr Corbyn, you're the leader of the opposition, uh, could you lay out the main elements of the Labour Party's foreign policies around the world? His answer would have been, whoa, Palestine, isn't it? That's it. Yeah. It's the only thing they ever talk about is Palestine, Corbyn and his lot. And uh, it's a strange affiliation, I assume... It's to do with the fact that Israel is seen as America's poodle in the mm. Middle East. Uh, but uh, they should remember, the critics of Israel and the big fans of Palestine, uh, that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East and that people, uh, gay people... The gay capital the gay the people, yeah. Gay people flee Palestine, mm. they flee Gaza yeah. to take refuge in Israel yeah. where the rights of the LGBTQ community are upheld. Mm. Uh, this is the truth of it. And there's actually an organisation, and this, like, just blows my mind. They're called Queers for Palestine, uh, <laughs> where they, they, they march, come on, Palestine, you're great. Pal well, Queers for Palestine, why don't you go out to Gaza, see how you go, go to Palestine, see how you get on. They'll chop your head off and chuck you off a multi-storey car park. It's like it's turkeys a, for Christmas, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly right. It's absurd, <laughs> bizarre. It is, it is. But I think the thing is, with this argument, as we were saying about sort of, it's a, it's a fashionable middle class argument and because is the, the Israel uh, issue is very much centered around these horrendous sort of uh, negative stereotypes the anti-semitic stereotypes about sort of the um, the me who runs the media and the wealth in it's it's sort of they they see it as connected with capitalism so it's therefore mm. very fashionable mm. to 
be anti-Semitic. Unfortunately, you know, if you're if you're a sort of middle class kind of woke person who wants to show off those sort of credentials, and I think that's why they back Palestine so mm. strongly because they believe that conspiracy theory. But this is why it actually matters when people do say things that are shockingly outrageous mm. and when uh, <clears throat> you have a whole tide of mm. virtue signalling and Israel gets excluded. Yeah. A, a story lately has been that um, the Football Association have had to apologise mm. because they light up Wembley Stadium with the colours, whatever, yeah. you know, the sympathetic flag is for that particular time. And after the October the 7th attack, they didn't yeah. light up the famous Wembley arch, uh, blue mm. and white. It was a big yeah. match that night as yeah. well. So that was the, mm. that's what the Jewish community were looking yeah. for in the sort of public publicity eye that this arch would be lit up and, uh, you know, express some support for Israel, which at the time, well, it, which still, you know, was just grotesquely invaded by mm. murderous thugs. Uh, but they didn't do it. Yeah. And now they say, oh, we're really sorry. Didn't realise it would upset you. I mean, the Football Association, if there's a mistake to be made, trust me, they'll make it. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? And that's why people were so sort of against politics in football all the way through that with the, the, the kneeling for Black Lives Matters and all the different badges and all these things mm. that they wear is that when you start taking those positions, then you're going to get caught up in a, in a situation like this. But can you imagine how reassuring it would have been for Jewish people in, in northwest London to see those yeah. those lights go up? And they were being persecuted mm. in the street at, the, at that time mm -hmm. by, you know, people out in floods in the cars, in the Palestinian yeah. flags going. It's very, very intimidating. So, you know, it, the Football Association, Association is absolutely right to climb down, down on this, mm. and they shouldn't. It, probably the easier uh, thing for them in going forward would be to just get politics out of football altogether. I mean, politics uh, arguably should also be out of universities. We're now learning the police are investigating a University of Bristol emeritus professor for suggesting on social media that someone should blow up the venue mm. of a Jewish Labour conference. I mean, uh, Harriet Bradley, as uh, that's her name, she wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter, under a post that said shadow cabinet members Wes Streeting and Bridget Phillipson were due, to, well, they were due to speak at the event. I mean, this is strong stuff. This isn't just saying, I don't think this should be held or I'd rather the Labour Party didn't attend. It's advocating for someone to go and essentially try and kill people going there. It's against the law. <laughs> it's, oh yeah, it's absolutely shocking, isn't it? An absolutely shocking thing to say. But I think that people who are on, on the left have a tendency to think they can get away with this stuff because generally they can say it and then they can sort of say, oh, well, you know, I didn't particularly mean it one way or another. If people on the other side, would you, you would be cancelled, you know, if you said something so extreme and rightly so, you know, this is... She will think, <laughs> yeah. you're right, she will think that what she did was righteous mm. and moral. This is the, this mm. is the state these uh, left-wingers are in yeah. about Israel. Anti-Semitism to them is justified. Yeah. It is a moral stance. It's not. It's disgusting mm. and it's racist. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about ITV. Yesterday, uh, they released uh, the results of their eagerly awaited report into the Philip Schofield saga that at uh, their... Uh, flagship daytime programme this morning. He waged a, an inappropriate relationship with a much younger male member of staff. Uh, he was accused of using his power to groom this kid and so on and so forth. So ITV uh, hired barristers to investigate outside. We're going outside. It's going to be independent, independent. ITV paid these barristers. <laughs> and guess what? The barristers delivered exactly what ITV wanted. You could knock me down with a feather. They said, nothing to see here. Nothing was wrong. Uh, ITV is completely cleared. I've got news for, bad news for ITV. You are not cleared. And uh, this report has opened, uh, far from closing the case, has opened a new can of worms, don't you think? Absolutely. I think that ITV behaved abominably in this situation. You can see from sort of the, the, the timeline of, of events here with Philip Schofield and this young staffer um, that, that, that there was, you know, a cover-up in action where he was swiftly moved from one place to the other. And I don't know how they can say, oh, well, we asked and they said no. You know, that's not, <laughs> that's not sufficient, is it? If they, if they are, you know, Philip Schofield at that time was in the closet or whatever, then, you know, he's not likely to admit to it. So it's just simply not good enough. And as we've seen time and time again with the BBC as well, with broadcasters think that they can mark their own homework mm. and uh, carry out their own investigations, it's just not sufficient.
Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about uh, things not being sufficient, the cancellation of comedy, I am uh, getting absolutely what fed comedy? up. We don't have it fed in this country now. anymore. <laughs> fed up now with uh, the, the woke classes getting rid of humour. Um, and this is a story coming from uh, the, the town next to my home city, Gloucester, Cheltenham. It's a bit woke and posh there, to be honest, but, you know, you know we, we let it go. Sorry, sorry um, Rebecca, this is a Gloucester talk. It's Gloucester talk. <laughs> I'm just speaking to myself and anyone from Gloucester yeah, yeah. watching, you know what I mean. But the Every Man Theatre... Dr Foster lives there, doesn't he? <laughs> I used to have a doctor called Dr Foster well, when I Gloucester. was growing up genuinely <laughs> Dr Bill Foster yeah uh, he, he was my doctor yeah, um, and he did drown in a puddle of rain uh, but anyway uh, the Everyman Theatre in Cheltenham has been running their panto Mother Goose and uh, like you know all pantos it had comedic songs in it and this one song uh, kind of ribbed vegans a little bit and uh, it, it's been cancelled because a schoolgirl said it's really upset me <laughs> If you want to know what it said... Yeah, go on. So we should do. put some meat on the bones, for want of a better pun. Yeah. Um, so they were basically spelling out the word vegans, and actors sang that A in vegan stands for annoying or anemic, and G stands for gassy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I, I suppose if you're a really serious vegan, you'd take offence to that, but it's a joke, and uh, as uh, people have responded on uh, Twitter, uh, for goodness sake, get a life, it's just comedy. Uh, not even particularly good comedy, but uh, this sums up, this is a motif of modern Britain, isn't it? The offence archaeologists looking for offence uh, everywhere. What the hell is the harm in this? Absolutely, and this is a generation that has zero resilience, you know, yeah. and they're going through a mental health crisis as well. I've got a 15-year-old daughter, Daughter and you know her her school is we've got you know the mental health department is you know um, the mental health department <laughs> jam packed full of you know yeah. you know it's saving very busy these children. Yeah, exactly. you got five thousand people <laughs> working it. You yeah. don't have the nurses' office anymore. You've got it's the your... entire sick bay and attached to exactly. Asylum. Uh, exactly. But these kids will cannot hear you know, humour against anybody. And this is, it's really dangerous. It's a dangerous precedent to set, isn't it? To sort of, oh, we better get rid of that song because mm. that's ribbing vegans. I mean, if you're vegan, you've got to kind of own it, haven't you? Mm. You know, they do preach to everybody and they are a bit gassy, so... Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know that, don't you? What's that? How do you know if someone's a vegan? Don't know. They don't worry, me. they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, though. They really will. Yeah, they will. It's it is to very, prove very that they are, are on a much higher moral plane than you. Now, very quickly, we can uh, reveal what Britain's happiest and unhappiest towns are. Drum roll, Within please. Within ten miles of each other, Richmond on Thames in West London, and further west, Hillingdon is the most uh, unhappy. <laughs> Richmond yeah. is the happiest. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you live down can, in Kent. Can, Are you, you happy you, where you live? I used to live in Killington, actually, which is quite interesting. There you go. Really? Well, you can is tell us why is it, it so unhappy? terrible. Why is it so bad? Why is everyone miserable there? I mean, it's just right next to the M25, isn't it? I suppose it's Boris Johnson uh, uh, yeah. constituency. I don't know why that would make... But it's, it's a bit of a barren place, kind of right on the edge of oh, London. You, you so. just, you just, uh, it's got great facilities. It's close to the M25. <laughs> <laughs> What, what did you do when you got to Hillingdon? I'm not stupid. A U-turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor old Hillingdon. It's all down to wealth, isn't it, at the end of the day? Richmond's got it. Hillingdon That's doesn't. That's true. That is exactly. pretty much Absolutely. that riddle solved. Yeah, money makes you happy, right? <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> anyway, coming up after the break, a fresh legal blow for Prince Harry in his bid to sue the Mail on Sunday. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. You love saying that, don't you, I Kev? Do. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Coming up in this hour, Prince Harry has lost his legal challenge against the Mail on Sunday, who he is suing over an article that he said attacked his honesty and integrity. And Rishi Sunak on the ropes. The Prime Minister is under pressure after his new Rwanda plan causes a deepening rift among the Conservatives. And crowds have gathered in Dublin to say goodbye to Shane McGowan, frontman of the Pogues, who died last week. All that coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Thank you. In an exclusive interview with Talk TV, Israel's president has dismissed calls of genocide against the Palestinian people. Speaking to author Douglas Murray, who has been in Israel and Gaza over the past few weeks, Isaac Herzog said that Gaza would need a regime change if it ever was to have a two-state solution. The genocide was applied on us. And it was a clear genocidal attack of thousands and thousands of people on thousands and thousands of of innocent civilians. Israel is taking all necessary steps by international humanitarian law to, uh, imp to uh, apply its right of self-defense in the proper manner. Prince Harry's libel case against the Mail on Sunday must go to trial according to a judge at London's High Court. The Duke of Sussex is trying to sue Associated Newspapers after it said he was trying to keep his legal war with the government over his security a secret. The media group is contesting the claim. A judge has now decided the case must be heard in court. Talk TV's royal correspondent Rupert Bell says this puts the royal family in a difficult position. Now, of course, there is always going to be a some degree of security around him because of just the nature of, of his situation by birth. But now he has chosen to back off, and they feel within the constraints of the security operation that he should not be deemed a special case. But unfortunately, Harry doesn't see eye to eye. 
A judge has ruled in favour of the UK government blocking Scotland's gender self-identification bill. Legislation to make it easier for people to change their legally recognised sex was passed by Scottish ministers last December, but became a constitutional dispute when the government stopped the bill from receiving royal assent and becoming law. Pressure is piling on Rishi Sunak over his Rwanda policy after it was revealed that the UK has already paid out £240 million to the African nation for the scheme. Another bill of £50 million is expected next year. MPs will vote next week on the Prime Minister's plan to send some migrants to Rwanda to deter channel crossings. Lord Marlon, Tory peer and friend of Boris Johnson, told Talk TV a split Conservative party is not what Sunak needs. The country, by and large, doesn't forgive uh, a party that uh, is uh, split. They want them to spend their time running the country rather than arguing amongst themselves. That doesn't mean to say there shouldn't be debate. And, of course... This Rwanda issue is uh, a, a, a subject of significant debate, and so it should be. A 16-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder after a woman was shot dead in East London, the Met Police have confirmed. They were called to an incident in Hackney on the 5th of December, where 42-year-old Leanne Gordon died at the scene shortly afterwards. Official figures show 97 homicides have been recorded in London this year, compared with 103 killings in 2022. And thousands of people have taken to the streets of Ireland to bid farewell to the late Shane McGowan. The Pogues frontman died last week, aged 65. Fans and supporters sang the fairy tale of New York as the coffin was carried around the city accompanied by a lone piper. Almost 6,000 mourners are attending the funeral mass, which is being held in Ninar, County Tipperary, later this afternoon. That's the latest. Now it's time for a weather update from Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. So this is the showery low that's triggering a lot of showers across western and central areas today, but there will be some sunshine and dry weather across the south and southeast, much better than yesterday. And temperatures are actually doing quite well in southern areas, uh, 11 or 12 degrees, nearer 8 across northern parts. Now, through this evening and night, that uh, showery low over Northern Ireland starts off really quite intense, but it does gradually weaken as it pushes northwards. Then there's a little bit of reprieve before we see the next weather system coming in that will bring rain right across the southwest by the end of the night, perhaps even as far east as the London area. So a wet end of the night here, gusty as well, but a frost-free night across the board. Tomorrow's weather's interesting because that rain gradually pushes northwards and grinds to a halt in central areas. So if you're travelling and you live across central Britain, be prepared for some quite Quite high rainfall totals, not particularly pleasant there. Gusty to the south, but the rain does clear through at least. Temperatures in the south, very mild, up to 12 or 13. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including the latest legal blow to Prince Harry, as well as Rishi Sunak's desperate defence of his Rwanda plan and his leadership. Uh, yes, desperate is the word, isn't it, Alex? It is desperate, but, you know, what's so desperate is the fact we're having to hear about yet another Conservative Prime Minister back against the ropes, party in disarray, can't agree on anything. Um, and you keep hearing about all these different factions, don't you, coming together in their sort of late-night hustles and huddles, the covens and the, the, the plotters. And you've got the, the, the One Nation Conservatives. They're the sort of centrists and they number over 100 and they're the sort of Cameroons who everything is, a, you know got to be centrist and got to yeah, be kind yeah. and we can't leave the ECHR because we'll look terrible on the international stage and they all live in the sort of safe Tory constituencies basically. Mm. Then you've got the sort of right wing of the Conservative Party, which is a myriad different factions. You've got the new Conservatives. These ERG, are the ones ERG that, the around. ERG, the ERG, they're, they're old school. They're the OGs of the right wing movement, as far as I can tell. And then there's some other, again, that are on the right wing. And they've all come together and said, well, you know, if Rishi Sunak doesn't leave the ECHR, we're going to force a leadership uh, contest. And Sir Graham Brady's thinking, great, I get my five minutes of fame again. Let me, let me ask you this. So, by the way, there's a very funny tweet 
out of Rishi Sunak turning up at number 10. Uh, and he can't get in. He can't get in. He's got, he's got keys. So uh, I, I thought the caption should be, they've changed the locks. Uh, but uh, you answer me this. You're much better informed than I, about, I am about uh, firstly everything, but certainly politics. Uh, uh, what do we get out of being a member of the European Convention on Human Rights? What on earth do we get out of it, apart from it blocking us as an independent sovereign country carrying out our own government? Well, Kevin, I'm glad you asked. What we get is <laughs> nothing! Hey, um, but hey. no, the problem is, what we, what we get is a massive headache, and the difficulty is, I think that, yeah, leaving the ECHR, it doesn't mean we're going to start sending kids up chimneys or bring back sort of, you know, capital punishment in town squares, because we'd have our own human Human rights and that would probably also be used by lefty lawyers as well let's be serious but uh, we would stop having this sort of um you know, judiciary by facts from these sort of faceless bureaucrats and the woke karate in a, a completely separate court in strasbourg the difficulty is you have to give a long lead time before you can leave it mm -hmm. uh, which most parliaments uh, you know whatever makeup we get probably but wouldn't agree to and then the other pr problem is yeah. is there are certain treaties which written in these big yeah. international treaties is things relating to the ECHR, including um, uh, the... the uh, it's gone from my head, it's fine. Listen, I'm going to ask you Northern a question. Ireland Peace Northern Treaty. Northern Ireland Peace Treaty. Protocol. Whatever. Well, listen, uh, I'm going to ask you a question just before we move on. It's as simple as this. Why yeah. do these elite MPs in Westminster prioritise international law mm. over the interests of you, the British people. Yeah. Ask yourself this. Ask yourself that. It's because they like sort of gallivanting on the world stage, glad handing other world leaders. They like being on their sort of, you know, board of directorships and going yeah. on their jollies and their fact-finding missions and aren't we a wonderful nation? Blah, blah, blah. And actually, the concerns of the average British person doesn't really cross them. No, no, no. They're, they're more interested in international law yeah. and globalism than they are. Us, a uh, quick word about Joey Barton. Oh, yeah, that's a uh, question the of the day. The footballer who says uh, that uh, women... Pundits, football pundits, should not uh, be commentating, commenting on men's football. Uh, there's his. Uh, there it is. Women should be talking. <laughs> shouldn't be talking with any kind of authority on the men's game. So, uh, tell us the question we're asking, Anna. Well, we are asking, uh, basically, is Joey Barton right to think those things? Should women not uh, commentate or comment on men's football games? I mean, I kind of think, well, what's wrong with that? But as long as they're not shoehorned in as some sort of tick box Don't exercise... Don't answer the question. <laughs> well, you know. Anyway, yeah. Oh, is, that, is that because I'm a woman and I can't comment on it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is men's business. Know your place. This is men's business. <laughs> do you want to do my um, sign language uh, while I read this out? Uh, Oh, go, go on then, then. So if you want to throw your two bit into the ring, you can give us a call on 0344 499 1000. There you go. You can text us on 8722. Or if you're feeling a little bit more coy and just want to send a tweet, the handle is at Talk TV. There you go. How was that? And uh, you've been messaging, messaging us a lot on this topic. Uh, now, Duncan thinks Joey Barton has gone too far. Female pundits are fine as long as they are knowledgeable. The problem comes when, as with the majority of punditry, they are included to tick the inclusion box, but their knowledge and experience is dreadful. Very well put. Michael says, I totally agree with Joey Barton. Every male-dominated sport has women presenting and commentating. It is too much. Oh, sorry. Uh, Gail says, I am an ardent feminist, but hate having women commentators who have never come <laughs> close to playing at the level of the games they're commentating on. Sick of having woke diversity targets rammed down my throat. I don't particularly like Joey Barton, but I agree with him on this one. Well, there you go. Interesting. interesting. I mean, I, all I would say about this is there are plenty of pretty good female... Sports like I journalists. said earlier, like, Alex, like Gabby Logan. I like Gabby Logan. I, I like don't Claire care Balding. on the. I, I don't, don't think Claire Balding's ever been on a horse and. Well, I don't. Taken I, it down I think the she has National. actually, but I don't care uh, whether they're female or male. I care whether they're but, any whether good. They're good or bad. And exactly. some of the women are really good, and some of them are really bad, and some of the men are really good, and some of the men are really bad. Maybe, That's my uh, judgment. That's. I maybe just, I, I should don't... start a new thing that you're not allowed to. Based on that last comment, you're not allowed to discuss politics unless you've been elected. <laughs> and basically, it's just me, isn't it? <laughs> That's a good point. I have every oh, program on You have on been this. elected. Exactly. And I see what you, I did you there. got my vote every day oh, of the week, thanks, Alex. Ken. There you go. Now, to our top story, and Prince Harry's legal case against the Mail on Sunday will go to trial after a judge rejected his bid to get the paper's defence thrown out. 
He's suing the newspaper group for libel following an article about his security arrangements, which he claims was an attack on his honesty and integrity. The Mail on Sunday argues it was an honest opinion, a defence Harry wanted removed, but today a judge refused to do so and concluded that the Mail had a real prospect of successfully showing that the Prince had misled the public over his private protection. Uh, joining us now uh, is media lawyer Paul Gilbert. Uh, hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us. I hi. would suggest uh, that uh, Prince Harry, uh, the uh, Duke of Sussex, did not have a very good day in court today. Uh, the judge, you know, effectively saying, you know, uh, I, uh, I, I support and back the newspaper's honesty. Uh, it is saying that it based this report on an honest opinion. Uh, and I don't put so much store by the Prince's honesty and integrity, which he said was impugned by uh, this story. So not a good day for Harry. No, I completely agree. I think um, tactically it was a very bad move to make this application. It's an application that uh, should only be made where it's really felt that the defence that's being put forward really has no prospect of succeeding. And what is quite clear from the judge's decision is that he feels there is a real prospect of succeeding. Uh, as you have just uh, said, uh, Kevin, it, it's, it's sort of added weight to uh, the paper's case. The, the, the other issue is that it would have slowed everything down so that um, the trial now is going to take place sometime next year. This uh, is going to be a, a news-worthy item that's going to be reported on extensively. Uh, and, of course, um, we have the mouth-watering prospect, or perhaps not, because, let's face it, as far as I can tell, Harry's going to spend most of next year testifying in various courts in London, <laughs> of um, Harry testifying from the witness box, just to be clear about where he gives evidence from. Uh, he argued that he wanted this debate over his security arrangement in the UK to be kept a secret, but he's whistling in the wind, wasn't he? Because it's going to be in the public interest, because at the end of the day, his security would have to be publicly paid. Yes, that's right, and uh, I, I think that's incredibly uh, naive on, on his part. Um, and uh, clearly, what, what's going to have to be determined by, by the judges is, is, um, is as, you, as, as Kevin, you explained, uh, this issue about um, uh, w whether it's, 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 it was expressing an honest opinion um, in the article that the Mail on Sunday uh, wrote, to, you know, to say that um, uh, he had um, uh, misled uh, in relation to um, what he was saying. Uh, of course, that 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 is all linked to the other case which we had this week, um, where he's applying for, to judicially review the refusal uh, of um, uh, the Home Office to provide him with protection, uh, even though he's paid for it. Uh, Paul, I'm not an expert on the law, but uh, I'm not bad on liable. Uh, you know, I've been sued a few times, never lost. I must uh, stress. Uh, so I know about this stuff. Uh, now, if I was a lawyer, uh, Harry is suing over this. The implication that he was sneaky and secretive about this legal action that he launched to try to get uh, royal armed guard, uh, police armed guard protection when he came to Britain. OK, uh, if Harry contends he wasn't being secretive, you know, that's annoying. But really, really, do you think people will go, oh, I've really gone off Harry, now he tried to keep this legal action a secret. It seems to me a good advice to him would have been, let this one go. It's not worth the money, the time or the effort. Wouldn't you agree? I, I would, uh, Kevin, and in a lot of ways, um, what we've just seen is, is a good example of where I think some proper tactical advice should have been given to him about whether... You know, there are battles to fight and there are battles where you walk away. Uh, and I think in this case, that is um, what uh, he should have done here. And certainly not to have taken the step of um, uh, issuing this interim application because he didn't need to do that. Uh, and, and really all that's done is to um, make this more newsworthy, put it out, out there, um, show him not succeeding in relation to, to uh, a part of the court proceedings that he's issued. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, overall, I think, yeah, you're right. That this is not the one to fight. Uh, and he's going to have to... He's going to have a tough time. There's no doubt about that.
Yeah, I mean, and it's not a good day when a judge says uh, <laughs> of the defence of the newspaper that's being sued, oh, you have a real chance of succeeding in this defence. Yeah, it's right. not a good day. And uh, that has been elicited by this action by Harry. So I don't think uh, he's doing very well at all. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Yeah, well, let's bring in Robert Jobson now, uh, who is a royal correspondent and author. Robert, uh, I mean, why is Harry so litigious? This was a battle he did not need to go after. I wouldn't mind actually seeing how much all of this is costing him. It can't be cheap having court case after court case after court case. But he really does have some sort of strange one-man crusade against the British press. Well, why? It's because he got too much money. That's the reality. I mean... The... None of us would have been fighting this case because we've been trained, as my nan would say, good money after bad. I mean, he's, he's clearly on a sticky wicket against the mail on Sunday, but he really seems to be... He's, this is not the only case he's fighting. As your previous guest said, he's, he's going to be in court most of the next, next year when the case is taken on. Uh, frankly, he needs his head examined. Uh... I mean, where does he go from here? Uh, as uh, Paul Gilbert just said, he, he, as far as he can work out, he's, Harry's going to spend the whole of the next year standing in various witness boxes, uh, fighting all these cases. Uh, I mean, why, why has he done this? As uh, Alex implied, he sort of declared war on all of the press. And most of his cases against uh, the newspapers seem to be, well, you know... I'm Harry. These are the newspapers. They're awful, aren't they? They're terrible, aren't they? Uh, and he doesn't seem to have too much to back all of this up. It's just he has this assumption well, that everybody well, hates the press it. just like he does. Well, he sounds like a sort of royal Hugh Grant, doesn't he? He's just a complete <laughs> whinger. The, the, the reality here is that he's upsetting his father's reign, which is a bigger picture here. Um, I suppose for him, it keeps him in the public spotlight. Um, which is what him and his wife want, because that way they can flog their wares and try to keep themselves current. But, you know, I don't really see the point of taking on the whole of the British press or even tiring the whole of the British press as, as, as something that is a bad thing. You know, you and I both worked in the tabloids, Kevin, in the 90s. I mean, you know, it, it was a different world then. It was yeah. like, you know, so it's improved it's that, it's cleaned up it's that quite a lot. So I think he needs to get with the times and realise that he's out of step. He can't control the press. He's a... He's uh, pretty much a washed-up royal, isn't he? He's not, he's not even working anymore. I don't know what he does. Oh, goes to court is what he does, apparently. Um, but, you know, well, you Maybe are... Maybe he can become a lawyer. Maybe he can become <laughs> a lawyer. Or... <laughs> I don't think he's going to the Parliament. For it. Oh, better not say that. Um, but, you know, uh, the thing is about Harry, it, it seems to me that this is just sort of narcissism, isn't it? He, he wants what his brother has. Meghan wanted what Kate has. They've turned around and said, we weren't welcome in Britain. We were driven out of the country. You've been covering the royal family for a long time. Remind us all what really happened. Well, if you were driven out of the, the country, why did you post a, stupid, a slightly ridiculous tweet saying I'm on the Freedom flight? I mean, you know, make your mind up, mate. I mean, the reality is he wants his cake and eat it. He, he does, he's does. he got far too much money, something that his father has obviously given him over the years, as, as his mother did as well. He's a bit of a sport brat. And I think that ultimately, if you want to go and live abroad and not work for a living, because I don't really see what he does, um, then do it, but don't keep going on about it and, and try to take on the British press who are too busy reporting upon, about proper issues in this country. You know, the, the politicians that are, are corrupt, politicians that are unelected, whatever. You know, the reality is we've got enough on our plate in the British press to worry on about the ginger winger, to be yeah, honest. Just, just quickly before you go, Rob, you've just written a book about King Charles. Uh, all of this, uh, obviously, is very upsetting. Uh, for our sovereign. Uh, lay that out for us. So tell us the effect that this has had on, on the king and indeed the rest of the royal family, particularly William and Kate as well. Well, Kevin, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, you know as a dad, you're always going to forgive your kids. You always do. you sure of them actually sort of doing something really horrendous. But, um, look, the king, I was in the, with the king in Dubai at COP28. Um, he gave a brilliant speech, I think, that this prime minister allowed him to to deliver, unlike the last uh, short-lived one, Liz Trust. Um, he spoke very well, eloquently, he spoke very well. He wasn't focused on Meghan and Harry and the sideshow that is them. I mean, I understand that, you know, he obviously is it's saddening, isn't it? But ultimately, the King just gets on with his job and he can't do anything else because, you know, you can't have this sort of distraction. Um, 
Yeah, it's saddening. I'm sure he's a little bit upset about it, but as it goes on, we're not dealing with a child here. We're dealing with a guy that's approaching 40. Perhaps he ought to look on his birthday card and realise he's nearly 40. <laughs> he's not a young man. He's a middle-aged man. So, you know, my <laughs> all I would say is be a man or be a, an adult rather than being a child. Robert, thank Thanks, you so Rob. much. He's, he Great said stuff. middle-aged. I turn 40 in about two weeks. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm not middle-aged. You couldn't. You're not 40, are you? Um, yeah, see, like two weeks and turning 40. I've sworn you were 50. That's just a joke, <laughs> folks. Over to you. Right, coming up after the break, the Conservatives tear themselves apart over Rwanda and uh, this tweet certainly isn't helping to heal divisions in the party. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, with 18 Tory MPs reportedly submitting letters of no confidence in the Prime Minister over his Rwanda legislation, there are concerns that Rishi Sunak might be forced to call a snap election. Uh, but putting on a united front in Washington last night, the newly appointed Foreign Secretary, Lord David Cameron, backed the beleaguered plan. Paul, what is being done, and I think the Prime Minister has done a good job at coming up with the right package, a treaty with Rwanda that only a couple of weeks ago everyone was said would be impossible, it wouldn't happen. Uh, it has happened, and it's a very good treaty. 
Well, we're joined now by former Liberal Democrat Minister Norman Baker. Norma, Norman, fantastic to have you here. I mean, putting to one side the typical letters of no confidence and the Tory infighting, which is basically just static at the moment, isn't it? That's all we've had for about the last 13 years, quite yeah. frankly. I think you should go back into coalition with them and sort them out. Um, in terms of this Rwanda plan, it was supposed to be the great fix. One side of the party's not happy with it, the other side aren't happy with it. But uh, forgetting the opposition between the two, could, could it work? Do you think? No, and he's made a rock for his own back. I mean, let me just say, I don't believe a word. I don't think David Cameron believed a word of what he said there. He, he'll understand it doesn't work. And the reality is that... Uh, yeah, by the, the way, the... nobody said that it would be impossible to get a treaty with Rwanda. Nobody, literally nobody no. said that. So. No. I mean, look, the issue is that um, if people are worried about migration, the issue is the 750,000 or whatever it is who are coming in legally. The number coming in by small boats... Is, is actually quite small compared to the legal position. But, you know, he's, gone, he's made a rock for his own back. He's made this thing about Rwanda the most important issue for himself. He's got no... He's got, he stopped no boats coming in. He's got no planes taking off. I mean, it's a complete failure. The other thing is the public at large, whatever the party is, they detect a party at war with itself, and they always punish those parties. Yeah. We saw it with Lib Dems, we saw it with Labour, and now we're going to see it with the Tories. But do you know, uh, they talk, uh, Rishi has made a big thing. Everyone is saying, uh, or lots of observers are saying, what a weird hill for, for Rishi to die <laughs> yes. on. It's not even his policy. Uh, and he calls up, we've got to give a deterrent, we've got to show the deter, deter these people from coming. If you go delve into the mathematics of this, do you know uh, how much chance of getting sent to Rwanda the average migrant here would have? But at the moment, Nor it's 0.5%. No, no, it's, it, it's, right? it's, it, it's 0.5%. Yes, and, and the number of people Rwanda would take, even under the scheme they've got, is minuscule compared to the numbers coming in. But I'll make a prediction here on, on Talk TV. I don't think there'd be a single person sent to Rwanda between now and the election. Uh, or ever, I yeah, wouldn't have thought. I, I, I agree. Uh, let's uh, bring in the Conservative MP for Bracknell, James Sunderland. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, James. Uh, we're trying to discuss the extraordinary capacity of the Tory party to self-destruct. <laughs> I mean, today they are arguing about a tweet that Tory party central office put out <laughs> of a BBC presenter giving the camera the finger and the caption, quite amusingly, I thought, was, this is the response you get from Labour when you ask them what they do about about the migrant crisis in color how dare you tweet this this is outrageous this is beneath us others say no 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 it's very funny what on earth are you lot doing why are you fighting like rats in a sack why don't you fight the labor party instead of destroying yourself kevin alex good afternoon it does my head in okay <laughs> um the best mps i work with are those who are team players i joined the conservative party as a member of parliament to be part of a team and I'm afraid some of my colleagues need to get over themselves. And do you think that the problem with the Rwanda policy is it was from a different era now, you know, the two prime ministers ago, and it was essentially to create a headline and put the cart before the horse without figuring out how it would actually work. And that because such a big thing's been made of it, Rishi Sunak is holding on to it for dear life when he probably knows in his heart of hearts it ain't ever going to take off. Well, look, there's lots in that, Alex, and I'll just give my view if I can. Uh, the first thing is that the Rwanda plan is not the beyond end all, OK? It is not the panacea, it's not the totality. It is part of a wider government strategy to disincentivise migrants from coming illegally to the UK. Crossings are down over the last 12 months. Albanian returns agreements, the list goes on. Uh, we've got a, a proven track record of success in reducing the number of boats coming across the channel. But what we need is a hard edge. What we need is something that's going to disincentivize completely migrants from coming. If they know that if they arrive illegally on our shores, they will be deported, it will stop overnight. As I just said, James, the problem with that is if you uh, look into the mathematics, the chance of a cross-channel migrant being sent to Rwanda if Rishi gets his scheme up and running is uh, half a percent, 0.5 percent. So it really does not offer much of a deterrent anyway. Uh, uh, and uh, if you want to do something with a hard edge, surely, uh, what the hell has Rishi got to lose now? Announce we're going to leave the European Convention on Human Rights and we're going to start sending migrants to Rwanda because we can. Again, I think it's difficult to answer. I mean, personally, this is about reverse engineering the effect that you want. In military parlance, this is about effects-based planning. So what do we need to do as a party? Right now, 
we need to stop the boats. So what Rishi and his team have done is worked backwards to work out what needs to be affected by way of a treaty and in law to stop the boats next year. I'm confident because I trust the Prime Minister. I'm confident, and he was very bullish and very bold and very clear at the 22. He was very clear with the press conference yesterday morning. I trust the Prime Minister and his extensive team of lawyers that this gives us the best chance. So what do I think? I think ultimately we need to give it a chance. We need to give the Prime Minister a chance and we need to back the Prime Minister. End of. I mean, 18 of your colleagues seem to disagree with that. It seems like Paul Sir Graham Brady is going to be wheeled out of the stationary cabinet before long. What do you feel when you see, you know, what you wake up and you read those headlines and the gossip that the letters are going in again? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, the Mirror reported 18 MPs. I don't believe it. My sense is next week that the vast majority of Tories will vote in support of the bill at second reading. Of course, we can look at it beyond that. We can amend it if we need to. We can do the deals behind closed doors then. But at second reading, this bill should fly through. And the reason is because with less than 12 months to an election now, this is do or die. Uh, this is about delivering our promise to the British people. This is about delivering the manifesto promise to stop the votes. This is about making sure that we revert to conservative policies. And as a low tax, low state conservative who wants to win the next election, getting behind the prime minister is absolutely the right way to do it. Uh, Norman, uh, James, uh, definitely one of the good guys, uh, but uh, mounting a sterling defence of his own party. Uh, not many people are buying this. I mean, no. Rishi, Rishi's plan, I don't think, will work. Uh, and that's why Robert Jenrick, the immigration minister, resigned. He said it won't work. Suella Braverman said the same. Uh, as uh, Alex said, letters are now going in, the legendary letters of no confidence <laughs> to the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. Maybe they were uh, just Christmas cards for Sir Graham. <laughs> well, you never know. Well, maybe they combined the two. <laughs> Happy Christmas, Graham. And by the way, I've got no confidence in the prime minister. Uh, what is it, you know, you've viewed this party from uh, across the House, from the other bench... And indeed from inside, from inside in the coalition. Yeah. But so, 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 well, there you go. So, so what is it about the Tory? All politicians do fall out sometimes. There are different opinions in all parties. They all like to say we're a broad church. Uh, but what is it about the Tories that have this particular propensity for self-harming and destroying themselves? This situation it, is almost unbelievable. Well, I mean, I think they've written off the election, to be honest with you. In their heart of hearts, they've written off the election and they're now fighting for the soul of the party after the election as to which direction it's going to take uh, following a Labour victory or a hung parliament. That's where it's going, um, and they don't believe they're going to win anymore. But, you know, you've got a, a position where the Tory party is riven from top to bottom. You've got people on one side who say, we cannot, we cannot break international law, this is a red line for us, uh, this is not what global Britain should be about. We're going to antagonise our friends. We don't want to join Belarus and Russia as the only countries outside the ECHR. You've got others on the other side saying the only way we can deal with this migration problem is to break out of the European Convention on Human Rights. And those two positions are pretty incompatible. Can I just ask you quickly, uh, what do you, th you see, as I say, my view is uh, he should do something bold and say we'll leave the ECHR and we'll go about our own business. However, he's not going to do this. So what he's come up with is this sort of mealy, yeah. weird, security. It's a Theresa May answer, actually. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. It's, it's to try to find the middle ground when there isn't one, actually. Mm. And what he needed to do, and what Theresa May needed to do, by the way, back in 2017 or whatever it was, was to either take a position saying, right, we're going to have this hard... Brexit, or we're not having Brexit, or soft Brexit, or we're going to have, um, or we're going to actually stay where we are in the European Union. You, you've got to have a, an absolute position, an extreme position, and this middle of the road thing just won't work. Mm. It will come mm. unstuck. I mean, James is right; he'll get it past second reading, I think, but he won't get it past the parliamentary third reading, and he won't get it past the House of Lords, yeah. and he won't get it past the courts. Uh, James, back to you. You heard what Norman Baker had to say there, and our sort of analysis that, for some reason, the Conservative Party seems to be particularly well-equipped at dysfunction. Um, <laughs> do you think that, <laughs> essentially, uh, something happened during that Brexit era, and this sense of ill-discipline just went out the window, and you're never going to get it back? Well, I think that uh, we've got people in the party with different views. I think we are a broad church. But, but ultimately, we don't need to go nuclear at this point in time. Why? Because the Prime Minister has to lead. He's got to find the common ground. It's about compromise. You can't have everything you want in politics. And there's no point falling on your sword in a hissy fit because you can't. In my humble view, 
I think it'd be the wrong thing to do right now to leave the European Court of Human Rights. Why? Because we're a founder member, because we are a global bastion of democracy. It sends the wrong message completely. Therefore, I do have sympathy with the colleagues on the left of the party who do not want us to break international law or leave the ECHR. But by the same token, we have to stop the votes. This is not a bad way of doing it. With the legal support that the Prime Minister has got, let's give it a chance. We have to go a bit further, but let's not go nuclear. And ultimately also, this is not about Brexit. This is not Brexit, the final phase. This is not about, um, about delivering the Brexit that some on the right of the party want. This is about stopping the boats and stopping the boats only. James, always do want a, more we, course. James, do you have a pilot's licence, by the way? I don't, but I wish I had. Yeah, I think that that'd probably <laughs> be the next best option, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, James. James Sutherland, the MP for Bracknell. Uh, before you go, Norma, just to, to go off piece for a second, you've written extensively about the royal family. You're uh, something of an expert uh, on the Windsors. Uh, what's your take on uh, this late? Just uh, legal drama involving Harry. He's lost uh, part of his case against the Mail on Sunday. Well, look, he, he seems to be obsessed with taking action against the Mail group in particular, but any paper that's offended him, I think every paper apart from the Telegraph, I think it's been subject to some sort of criticism or action from Harry. He seems to have too little to do and too much money to spend trying to get revenge for something which nobody's quite clear what it is. So I think he's a damaged individual, to be perfectly frank with you, but, I mean... These court cases don't seem to be going anywhere, and he should actually just reset his life. If he wants to reset it in California, fair enough, but uh, reset his life and stop pursuing these matters as he's pursuing them. It does, it, yeah. it does seem very obsessive. Do you know, between anything. the Conservative Party and Prince Harry, it's been a great year for lawyers, hasn't it, 2020? <laughs> <laughs> you never see a poor lawyer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's always a great year for the lawyers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, coming up after the break, thousands have lined the streets of Dublin to say goodbye to the Pogues frontman Shane McGowan. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV, sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not Conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. 
Are with you prepared you? to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the funeral of Pogue's frontman Shane McGowan is taking place in Ireland today following his death last week. Thousands of mourners have lined the streets of the Irish capital to say goodbye to the star, famous, of course, for his festive hit, The Fairy Tale of New York, which his widow and friends now hope will be made number one for Christmas. Uh, joining us now from over there is journalist Ken Murray, who who is outside the church in Nina, where the funeral mass is due to take place. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, we were told there'd be a big star turnout. Uh, have you seen many famous faces there? I'm afraid not. Uh, so far, it's been rather thin on celebrities. Uh, the only name of note that I've seen go into the church here in Nina is a man called Glenn Hansard. Not exactly a household name in Britain, but Glenn Hansard won the Oscar for Best Song at the Oscars back in 2007. But it's expected that a lot of high-profile names from the world of rock and roll, from politics, and indeed from public life in Britain and Ireland uh, will attend when the mass gets underway here at St Mary's Church in Nina at about half past three. As you said in your introduction, uh, the... Uh, funeral cortege of Shane McGowan got underway in Dublin City this morning at 11 o'clock. It was uh, preceded by the Artane Boys Band, ceremonial band, and it made its way around a number of streets in Dublin. And there seems to be a, a theme of rebel or rebellion running through this funeral because the uh, funeral cortege in Dublin uh, went to the small town of uh, Ringsend and then made its way to Pierce Street. Porrick Pierce was a famous rebel in the 1916 rebellion in Dublin when uh, rebels engaged in an uprising to try and end British rule in Ireland. So Porrick Pierce was one of uh, Shane McGowan's heroes, if you like. The funeral cortege then made its way into a street known as Westland Row. Westland Row is where Oscar Wilde was born. And then further on up at the top of Westland Row is a place called Sweeney's Pharmacy, where the cortege stopped. And Sweeney's Pharmacy was made famous in the book Ulysses by James Joyce. So these were people that uh, Shane McGowan looked up to and admired uh, during his particular life. And one thing that's uh, by pure coincidence, I presume, but today is actually the uh, anniversary of the birth date of Sinead O'Connor. She was born on December the 8th. So she was another rebellious Irish woman and somebody that uh, Shane McGann looked up to uh, and admired. So the funeral procession left Dublin City at around 12 noon. It made its way down the M7. It's currently en route. Nina is about 100 miles from Dublin City, and we expect the funeral cortege to arrive here uh, at St. Mary's Church uh, within the next half hour to 45 minutes. In terms of celebs, well, the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, will be here. In his statement last year, he described Shane, Shane McGowan's music as music like crafted poetry. Other big names who spoke very highly about Shane McGowan in the last seven days were people like Bruce Springsteen, the rocker Tom Waits, uh, and Paul Simon. There's an expectation that Australian singer Nick Cave will be here, as will Hollywood actor Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp was the best man at Shane McGowan's wedding to Victoria Mary Clark back in 2018. So these are the names that are being spoken about here in St. Mary's Church in Nina. 
Well, he deserves, Ken, uh, a good turnout, I think. Uh, and, of course, I think uh, for uh, many people around the world, he's, he's obviously famous for Fairy Tale of New York, which, by the way, uh, we are hoping gets the number one. Don't forget, Shane was born on Christmas Day. You mentioned Sinead O'Connor. She uh, was a close friend of him. She once reported him to the police for heroin use in 1999, uh, obviously hoping to help him there. Uh, but he's very famous for his... Uh, uh, lifestyle, his drinking, his drug taking, uh, which possibly overshadows unjustifiably his talent, uh, the brilliance of the Pogues, his brilliant songwriting. Uh, try to sum up what Shane McGowan means to Ireland. Well, Shane McGowan was, if you like, singing Irish songs, songs about Ireland, the Irish emigrant experience, particularly in the 1980s. And, you know, you will recall that it was difficult to be Irish in Britain in the 1980s. The IRA campaign was very active in Northern Ireland and at times uh, spread to, to England and particularly to London. It was difficult to be Irish. People like Terry Wogan, people like Eamon Andrews, uh, people... Um, like Dana, the singer who won the Eurovision Song Contest, were all making a name for themselves uh, in Britain in the 70s and the 80s. And Shane came along at a time when, as I say, it was difficult to be Irish. You will recall, of course, that the IRA uh, tried to kill Margaret Thatcher in Brighton in 1984, I think it was, and this created a lot of bad feeling towards the Irish. But Shane McGowan was a guy who if you like, stood up to the hostility towards Irish people, particularly with his distinctive Irish traditional sound. And it connected very well with Irish people and indeed Irish people around the world. He was a rebel. He was fond of his drink. Uh, that's, you know, that's no secret. He was very fond of drugs as well. He got himself into a lot of trouble. And yet, despite the difficulties he faced in his personal life, his music shone through. And I suppose to cheer you up, uh, to make you feel good <laughs> on this very wet uh, December day, I was reading recently that the song Fairy Tale of New York, written by Shane McGowan and his co-writer Jem Finer, it was earning something like half a million a year in royalty payments for the two songwriters. Because, as you know, once... December rolls around. Every radio station in Britain, Ireland, Canada, America and Australia, wherever there are large Irish communities around the world, they play this song off the air and he has benefited greatly from those royalties. But today, the people of Dublin and in particular, the people of Nina. This is where his parents came from. He was born in Pembury in Kent, but here is a place where he came to uh, as a child and got very much engrossed in the Irish way of life, the Irish Irish culture, a place where he visited regularly and had lots of friends, and it, indeed it was one of his uh, desires that on the time he would die, he would have his funeral mass in this town. They've been showing their respect and appreciation for his work and his genius by showing out here in large numbers today. So the funeral mass gets underway at half past three. A number of musicians and bands will perform in the church following the funeral mass this evening. The funeral cortege will make its way around Nina Town, give the locals a final opportunity to say their goodbye to Shane, and he will be cremated tomorrow, and we're told his ashes will be sprinkled into the nearby River Shannon. Thank you ever so much. I mean, it's just interesting, that song. It's that juxtaposition, isn't it, with the normal saccharine of Christmas and then the sort of character, that sort of misanthropic, rebellious streak that I mean, um, it's, it's Shane one, McGowan it's represented. Of, it's, it's one of very few Christmas songs that are actually good. And uh, I hope we, I'm sure we'll get to number one in Ireland, uh, but Piers Morgan has tweeted, we owe it to Shane to get it to number one in Britain because it, uh, obscurely, it never has been number Is one. It so, no, it never has. So mm. let's get it to number one for Christmas, uh, which is Shane McGowan's birthday. Now, moving on, uh, former Manchester City and Newcastle player and manager Joey Barton has sparked a backlash after saying women do not have the authority to commentate on men's football matches. I don't want to see sexism in football, but if we don't talk about this properly and debate this properly, this is just going to further rise and, and rise and ruin um, as I say, the experience of, of watching, you know, elite level men's football. And, and as I say, every, everywhere you turn now, um, there's, a, there's for, for what I would deem as an unqualified opinion, um, 
commentating, uh, pontificating about the sport I love, and it's it's ruining my experience of it. Um, and it's 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 to fuel this woke agenda. And if we're not careful, we're going to in, in, increase sexism massively because it's it, it's got to be a true meritocracy, Piers. Well, we all agree with a true meritocracy, that's for sure. Now, your tweets have been coming in on this. Mary says, I'm not going to apologise for agreeing with him. Why have we got to pander to the politically correct woke brigade who says that women need to be involved in everything? The women's game is totally different to the men's game and the commentary should reflect that. Wayne writes, I would get rid of Gary Lineker and yeah. replace him with a female commentator any day. Uh, yeah, we all agree with that. And Alan says, while I do often find female commentators too high-pitched I oh. have to turn the sound down. There much. are some excellent ones. Sue Barker, Gabby Logan and Hazel Irvine, to name but a few. Uh, joining us now is Nicola Wilburnshaw, a lawyer who is involved in the women in sports movement. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us, Nicola. Uh, your thoughts, I guess, basically, uh, as I keep saying, my view on female pundits is if they're good... They should do it. If they're no good, they shouldn't do it. Just the same as the men. I don't have any problem what your gender is. Do you know your stuff? Would you agree or do you think uh, Joey has a point when he says that if you don't know about the men's game, as women don't, uh, or they don't play in it, then you shouldn't be commentating on it? I agree with you wholeheartedly on that point. It should be a meritocracy and, you know... Joey Barton has made that point himself in certain things that he's saying should be the best person for the job. But what he's done and how he's gone about communicating what is essentially his opinion and is he entitled to that one? Of course he is. But if you're trying to make a persuasive argument based on an opinion that you have, you know, I'm a lawyer, of course I'm going to say this, but what you do is base it on solid evidence to get people to agree with you. He singled out, for example, Alex Scott by saying um, she's not qualified to talk with any authority um, about the men's game. Well, that's just a completely flawed argument. Um, you know, she has a degree in professional sports, writing and broadcasting, um, a playing career that spans over 16 years, including playing at international level for England. Um, so that argument is, is weak. And what happens when you start presenting arguments that are based on weak evidence is that you just end up looking rather silly, to be quite honest with you. Um, so the argument is what we might call in the courtroom as, as uh, slightly nonsensical. Um, these comments about uh, completely different games and things like that, again, you know, we've talked about this previously. I've been on the show previously and I've said the rules of football are the rules of football, whether you're male, female, child, adults, transgender, whoever you are. The rules are the rules. So, again, it's another weak argument. Sexism, and let's be frank, making such a broad generalisation um, like Joey has, that sort of behaviour does need to be called out. The same as any other socially and morally unacceptable language and behaviour, such as anti-gay or racist. But the difficulty we have here is that, you know, we live in an age of social media. He hasn't specifically done anything wrong um you know the fa can't take any professional action against him he's not in their jurisdiction he's been unemployed uh, for over a month or so now um but you know he needs to be careful of not not straying into the realms of, of a defamation action against him by singling out particular pundits um and we have a responsibility too to not stir up a sexist row here um, and all of us have a part to play in not being complicit in inciting any level of misogyny or any other hate language or behaviour for that matter. I mean, the is, and the there's an argument that Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, the problem is, Nicola, what we've entered, entered a sort of era now where the good arguments people want to make about women being considered equals are being overshadowed by a kind of over-promotion as a tick box exercise. You're absolutely right. And, of course, there is going to always be a school of people that have that thought. Um, but essentially, you know, Jimmy Barton, he, he's not bereft of a general level of intelligence here. Nick he knew the reaction. Well, you're all the way, Nicola. We're going to have to go to due to it. time. Thank you so much for talking to us. That was uh, Nicola Wilbur, <laughs> senior lawyer. Sadly, Alex, we've become to the end of the show and the week. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time on Monday. Yeah, up next, of course, is Ian Collins. Uh, have a good afternoon from us, though. Bye-bye.
It's the world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going, to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news, you've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative